Hello everyone. I hope you all had a great lunch before this and uh, we just had an amazing lightning talk session and after that we had Victor Steno gave a keynote um, talk and it was so great to know about the present and future of Python and where the community is headed. Now, after all of this, I hope you all are relaxed, had a good break. We have a very special talk lined up for you from our platinum sponsors, DE Shaw. We have Arvid with us, and uh, I would like to add Arvid to the stream right now. And we still have a couple of minutes to go, so we'll just, yeah. Hey, Arvid, can you hear me now? I can hear you, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you clearly. Feel free to introduce yourself. We still have a couple of minutes to start, so if you want, you can uh, go on with the introduction and more about DE Shaw. Okay, I actually have a slide for that, so maybe I'll do that now. Um, <clears throat> so I'm Arvid Besson. I work at the D. Shaw Group. Um, I'm in our New York office. We also have a big office in Hyderabad. Um, and I'll talk about what I'm going to talk about in the talk, but D. Shaw, um, yeah, I have like this, this one slide here that sums it up. <clears throat> so we are a global investment and technology development firm. Uh, we are known as a pioneer in quantitative investing. So we've been doing that for 30 years. Um, and what does quantitative investing mean? Well, we use a combination of quantitative and qualitative tools to uncover independent, hard to find sources of return across global public and private markets. Okay, in case you're wondering what that means, <clears throat> that means we take a lot of data, um, that's the quantitative part, and run some algorithms on them that tells to tell us where to invest um, and uh, we do that across yeah the world global public and private markets so <clears throat> public markets in this case are stock markets private markets would be private offerings Great. so still i guess half a minute left so i'm just gonna circulate the news around that we're going to start the session on daily stage so if uh, if you are on the Delhi stage right now, feel free to reach out to your friends on Zulit, tweet about it, and ask everyone to just join Delhi stage right now. We're going to start with the session. And uh, it's about time, so I'm going to share my screen. Yeah, you have uh, a big screen right now. OK. Let's get started. All right, so this talk is about array time travel with versioned HDF5. This is um, an open source project. You can find the code on uh, GitHub. The link is right here. And it was created by the DE Shaw group, which is where I am working on, uh, working at. My name is Arvid Besson. Um, and uh, yeah, let's get started. So. I already showed this slide. So the DE Shaw Group, we're a global investment and technology firm. Um, what I'm talking about today, version HDF5, was done in conjunction with a firm called Quantsight. Quantsight is a data science and analytics consulting firm specializing in open source software. They are committed to building the open source data economy by connecting the people and organizations who participate in creating value from data. And D. Shaw <clears throat> collaborates with Quantside on numerous other open source projects, not just version HDF5, including, for example, Numba, Dask, and Jupyter. And you can Google them. They're all really cool Python projects. There might be even a talk about some of those um, today. All right, so but what are we going to talk about today? Um, first, let's get a handle on the problem that we're trying to uh, tackle. When um, we do computations at DE Shaw, what we do is we have data that comes in, and then we have the sort of flow graph of how the data flows through the system. We compute something on the data, and then eventually you get some result back. Um, the problem is that data gets updated every day. So let's say, Simple example, you look at stock prices, right? So you get new stock prices every day, the stock market trades. In fact, you get stock prices every second or every millisecond. How do you handle that data gets updated while you're running computations on them? That's the main focus of this, this talk. Um, 
the way we are going to tackle that is uh, we're going to first take a step back by looking at HDF5, which is a file format for numerical data, and H5Py, which is a Python layer on top of that, that exposes that numerical data as NumPy arrays. And then we're going to build on top of H5Py, <clears throat> and we have this library called versioned HDF5. That's in the title of the talk that wraps H5Py in a way that allows us to track the evolution of data. And <clears throat> finally, at the end, hopefully, um, version HDF5 allows us to solve our data flow evolution or updating problem. All right, so let's look at an example for a data flow graph. Um, I hope you can see my mouse. Um, so. Um, Data flow basically means you have some data that you get from somewhere, right? So you get your stock prices or you get your temperatures from all the various places around the world, or you get your I don't know, latency measurements from all the computers that you own, or you get your web page impressions. All this data you get from somewhere and then you want to compute something on that, right? So you combine data one and data two, you compute something and probably get some result that that's, I call that intermediate result one um, that you might want to store on disk as well. And then you compute a little bit more on that. And eventually, you know, after many steps, after combining many data sets, you get your final result. I call that res.h5 here. The .h5 is the HDF5 file extension. Um, but you could store that anywhere, right? It could be stored in any file format. It could be stored in a database. We have roughly the same sort of procedure, right? Your data comes in, you compute intermediate results. On the intermediate results, you compute more and eventually you get some final results. Now, what happens when data gets updated? So if you look at your computation like this graph, you can see, oh, if let's say data one gets updated, I only need to rerun computation one, which means I don't need to rerun computation four, which means I need to rerun computation five, and then I get my new result. I don't have to run computation two and computation three. That's sort of the nice part about thinking about your uh, computation as sort of a flow graph where the data flows through your computation. But um, what are the problems when you get these updates? Well. We have two problems that I want to talk about today. The first one is, how do we achieve consistent results if the data changes during the computation? Let's go back to our previous slide. So let's say, you know, data one gets updated, right? That means we run computation one, which means we get the intermediate result one, which means we run computation four. Now computation four reads data four. Right? So basically it's a its dependencies are one, two, three, and four. But let's say while we're running computation four, somebody updates data four, right? So you get new, whatever it is, new data from your satellites or your, your mobile phone network or whatever you're getting. Um, if data four gets updated, that means we also need to recompute this path of the graph, right? So computation three, the mean result three, and then we arrive at computation five. Um, computation five combines this result with this result, but if you look closely, you see that data four comes in through two paths. Um, and this computation four could potentially have an old, uh, you could have used an old version of data four, while this path could have used a new version of it data four. So we will get inconsistent results because data four is not used in uh, at the same sort of uh, point in time consistently. All right, that's problem one. If data changes, we get inconsistent results. The other problem that uh, we're trying to tackle is, um, let's say, you know, you run your computation and you run it again the next day and then you update it again on the day after that. And then somebody comes to you and says, so the numbers you produced two days ago are wrong. How did that happen? You know, we, we lost some money because you suggest the wrong trades in our example. That's what we do at DSHA. How do you explain results if the stored data has already changed, right? It's gone. We don't 
we don't easily reconstruct the data. Well, the solution is uh, well known in computer science uh, literature world. Uh, it's a temporal database. Unfortunately, that's not something, if you go to Google and say, buy a temporal database, <clears throat> unfortunately, that's not something you can just do. Um, there are very few commercial vendors that sell you a temporal database. It's very much still a research topic. Um, SQL Server, Microsoft SQL Server is probably the closest, but they, they don't have a true real temporal database either. Um, so what does a temporal database do? A temporal database records how data changes through time. So what's time? Well, there's actually two times. And um, they are normally called valid time and transaction time. Valid time means when a fact became true in the real world. Think about a time series, right? If you have your temperature measurements, I don't know uh, where you guys are, but uh, where I am, it's now um, 18 degrees Celsius, right? And yesterday it was 16 degrees and tomorrow it will be 15 degrees. So you look at this, this uh, temperature and you can see how it changes through time. That's the time in the real world. But then <clears throat> you record those times um, and their temperatures in the database or in your file or in your, your store, whatever it is, um, at a certain time as well. Normally there is a lag, right? So you have some, some data that you measure right now. It says uh, at this point in time, it is this uh, degree out there, but then it comes into the database a little bit later. So let's look at the example, right? So we say the temperature or whatever it is, at 1602.45 is one. And then it takes a little bit to you know, go from the sensor to the internet to our database. And at 1602.51, we record in the database, yep, the temperature was one. And then we get another data point, right? At 1603 and 20 seconds, we get, um, oh, the temperature is now three. And then again, it takes a little bit to go into the database. Um, so this is the valid time axis. Right? So it tells you this is the time in the real world. The temperature at 245 was one, the temperature at 320 was three. This is when things landed in the database. Now, if I query my database and say, um, what was the temperature at um, 1603, um, let's say, and zero seconds. Well, then uh, it will give me this one back. But if I ask it, um, if, what was the temperature at 1603 and 30 seconds, it will give me this, this three back. But um, I can also combine that with a transaction time in my query. I can say, what was the temperature at, let's say, 1603 um, and 30 seconds? Um, but uh, did you know about this before 1603, for example? Um, and the reason why we do this combined query is because there are situations like this where, you know, a data come uh, a datum comes in late at 1603 and 12 seconds. The temperature was two, right? So now the the value changed in the real world goes from one to two to three, but this was only recorded in the database at a much later time. So this kind of database is called a bitemporal database because it has two time axes. It tracks when uh, data is sort of, when a data point is true in the real world and when it entered the database. That's kind of what we want. We want to record how our data changes and most of our data has the time axis that says, you know, this is the stock price at, for this time. This is the temperature at this time. Okay, so this is what we want. Well, what do we have? Well, what we have is we have NumPy arrays. We're using Python, we're using NumPy. We store those NumPy arrays on disk. Um, but uh, for now, let's just think about why are we using NumPy arrays? Well, they're great, uh, they're fast, there's index access. Our developers uh, love them because they're very, very familiar to them. 
Um, and for homogeneous data, let's say all integers, all floats, all dates, um, they're very efficient. There's a couple of options to store NumPy arrays on disk. Um, I listed some here. We are using H5Py, which is a wrapper around HDF5. HDF5 is an open source um, yeah, file format um, with an associated high performance library that's used in the high performance computing. And H5Py exposes that high performance file format as a NumPy array. Cool. So we have that, we have arrays. How do we use that? Well, um, it's relatively simple. You just open a file for writing in this case, and then you can just store any NumPy array that you want in that file. And you can store, in fact, uh, more than one NumPy array in the file by giving it a, a name. So I create a so-called dataset foo with this NumPy array. And I can read that foo dataset back out, and I can slice it, um, and I can print that NumPy array, and I can you know, write more than one. I can also create nested uh, datasets. Right? So H5Py has a sort of uh, idea of groups, which are um, like folders. Right? So in the bar folder, I create two, um, two datasets, Baz and Boo. And I can store all my NumPy arrays in there. Cool. So we have arrays covered. How do we version them? Well, here's the trick. So this is what we're going to use, the feature of HDF5 that makes our versioning work. Um, HDF5 does not store uh, NumPy arrays just in a contiguous way, like they are stored in the memory. But NumPy is a con or arrays in general are contiguous blocks of memory. So you have you know a million ints and they're all right next to each other in memory. What you can do with HDF5 is you can break this up. So if in this case I have a two-dimensional array, I can break it up into these little chunks here. They're all the same size. And HDF5 stores each of those chunks individually. Why is that better? Well, it's better because if I don't want to read the entire array, if I just want to uh, acts as a subset, then I just need to look which chunks contain that subset and I only read or load only that into memory, only the chunks that I'm actually, that I actually care about. Okay, chunks and versions. How do we combine them? Well, if we want to version an array, versioning means we want to record the transaction time. We need to be able to handle pens, inserts, updates, and deletes. So the pens means new data goes to the end. Um, inserts mean you, know, you insert something in the middle and then everything shifts to the right. Updates mean um, you have some data that, that changes, but the array itself um, stay the same. And uh, deletes means, you know, some elements disappear, um, and then things shift to the left. As you probably know from uh, experience with arrays, uh, just you know, in general, when you're doing computations with them, inserts and deletes are kind of expensive because the old data moves either to the right or to the left. So you need to update a lot of things um, after, after the point that you modified. Well, pens and updates are kind of cheaper or good because we only touch new data. And unfortunately, it will turn out for our version HDF5 that that same will be true. So let's see how we how we do versioning on HDF5. Well, we do use the idea of the chunks that uh, we talked about. So. Um, Version, uh, sorry, HDF5 has a feature that is called the virtual data set that says, I can create a data set that doesn't have any data actually stored on disk. It just maps its chunks to the chunk of some other data set. So let's say we create our version zero and we create some raw data which contains the actual data. Right? So you have 
chunks, in this case from 0 to 1024, 1024 to 2048, and so on. And we just, you know, we map chunk 1 to chunk 1, chunk 2 chunk to chunk 2, chunk 3 to chunk 3. We haven't gained much, right? We have just a, a cheap virtual data set, but what's the, what's the benefit of this? Well, if we write to chunk 1 and chunk 2, what we can do is we can actually write copies of chunk 1 that are modified. I call those chunk 1.1 1 .1 and chunk 2 are also modified. I write chunk 2.1. And then I can create a new version, let's say version 1, where of my virtual data set that points chunk 1 to this chunk 1.1 1 .1 and chunk 2 to chunk 2.1. Well, chunk three still points to the old data. So we have two virtual data sets, V0 and V1, I call them here. They both point to this raw data set and they're all accessible all the time because the raw data set is immutable. We never change anything. Um, cool. So. Summary, how do we version? How do we do versioning? We create a virtual data set for each version, and each version is a view on the raw chunks. Okay, so how do we use this? Um, well, here's a little demo. Um, so same syntax as before, we open a file with HDF5 or with H5Py. Then we wrap this file handle in what we call a version HDF5 file. And now we can create version zero. And we do that by creating this, by having this context here where we say with stage version and we pass in the name. I called it V0, but it could be called anything you want. And then in this block here, you can create your data set and uh, you can assign whatever you want. I guess you can see what I did is this, you know, assign the increasing numbers from zero through 10. So how do I create the next version? Very similar. So open the file, wrap the file in a version HDF5 file, create this context uh, for version V1. You manipulate your data set in that context. All the changes in that, or all the changes you, you do within that context are accumulated. And then once you exit this context block, or once you exit this width block, it is saved to the file. So let's see, moment of truth. Can we get the old data and the new data? Yes, we can. So we open the file, we wrap the file handle and the version HDF5 file. We can get the current data by saying ver uh, version file of version file dot current version data set name and then just you know slice all of it and indeed this is the current version that we wrote in the previous slide we could also say vf of v1 or we could also access things by timestamp that's what i'm doing to get the old versions right so you can get the old version either by name so i said vf of v0 and that's what is printed here or vf of some timestamp and that's printed here as well. So you can get both versions. And if you write many more versions, you get get all of them um, as well. Okay. Um, one thing that we need to talk about is um, how do we reuse chunks? If you move things, right? If you insert or delete things, how do we? Uh, we use chunks. How do we figure out which which uh, virtual data should point to which raw data set? The way we do that is by using content hashes, uh, using SHA-256. It's very similar to what Git does. So in the Git version control system, you um, look at each file, you hash the contents and see, is there already an entry for that hash? And if you, there is, then um, you can uh, you can reuse that. You know it didn't change. How does it look for us? Well, if we create a data set, right? We have a virtual data set, V0 in my 
Uh, so the, the original version mapping to a raw data set. And I picked a chunk size of just three because otherwise it doesn't fit on the slide. Uh, normally, of course, you would pick something much bigger. Right? So in this case, chunk size is explicitly specified as three. So one chunk, another chunk. This is the raw data set. Um, but we also keep a map of content hashes. As those are 256 bits mapping to those slices here. And if I then modify my data set, let's say I insert 777 at position three. Um, so my version one now looks looks like this. You can see the arrows, right? Zero, one, two. Then the next one goes here, 777, followed by three, four. So the order is sort of switched around. Uh, this hash map allows us to discover that we can reuse data, we can reuse a chunk. That's kind of a, a neat trick that we that we exploit. Um, yes, there are some collisions, um, but they're extremely unlikely, the same way that Git has to worry about collisions. Um, and we will implement that <coughs> in a future version, hopefully soon. Okay. What's the performance of this? Um, well, remember the slide where, we, where I said that inserts and deletes are bad and appends and updates are good. If you do mostly appends and um, mostly updates, um, then the performance penalty over just writing the file straight is not that big. If you do a lot of you know things where data moves around, um, you have a big performance problem. Well, not a big, but it's, it's like a 10, 20 times slower than just straight HDF5. There is a lot more information in this blog post that I linked here at the bottom. So almost done. We have versioned arrays, but what did we want? We wanted bitemporal data. We wanted bitemporal tables, in fact. Well, what's a table? A table, as you probably know from, from experience with pandas data frames or similar libraries, it's just a collection of columns, and the columns are just arrays. So uh, let's build our table out of column arrays, and then when a table changes, when we update something, uh, we can do that by using transactions. Right? So we modify all the arrays that are in the table in one version. And then we can get this kind of table. Well, we update it to version one by updating all three arrays in the table simultaneously <clears throat> as well. So they all need to grow to size six, and then we write the new data. And then you can get version tables. And you can see um, in my example, I picked something that is actually turned out turns out to be by temple. I have a valid time in here. This is the stock price for Google, and this is the stock price for Apple, and this is how they evolve through time. And I can Look at version zero and version one, and we can see them simultaneously. All right, did we solve our problem? I think we did. So um, we were worried about consistent computation if the data changes while we are computing. We can do that by at picking a transaction time, let's call it T at the start of the computation, and then querying all the data with that T. Um, can we explain results if stored data has changed? Yes, we can, right? Because all the data in all the old versions is still there. We just need to pick the right transaction time and we can query it at uh, the prior transaction time. All right, and that's it. So version HDF5 can uh, version NumPy arrays. Um, it's a drop and replacement, feature complete, high performance, and it's open source. You should try it out and uh, contribute. And uh, if you have any questions, I'm happy uh, to take them now. Okay, let's see how does this work. Where would I where I see the questions? Hey, Avid. Yeah. That was great. So we have questions from the audience. Number one, um, interesting, like using append only logs. Basically, we are indexing the data sets rather than scanning complete arrays, right? Uh, 
Yes, so the append-only log is a, is a very good comparison, right? So you you have, and sometimes you have a transaction log where you append all the, the things that you modify. Um, it's a little bit different uh, from a, a transaction log in a database. The transaction log in a database will also say what you do, and you just store the content. And um, then, yes, what we do is we, we use this sort of indexing of, you know, you, you have this virtual data set that maps all the indexes of the virtual data set to the raw, the log or the raw data that um, that we store. And because that's, you know, O of one, right? indexing is this cheap, you just, uh, just need to say, okay, I want index 5,000, uh, so that maps to index, let's say, 3,000, the, the, the virtual to the raw data set, you can just get that, and that's that's cheap and fast. Okay, so we have a second question. Does using HDF5 make sense with SSDs? Um, I think it does. I don't, I mean, to be honest, I've never used it with anything other than, <laughs> than SSDs. Um, it's, uh, the, the way it works internally, and I'm not an expert in HDF5, so I just sort of, I work two abstraction layers higher than that. Um, the way HDF5 works internally is it uh, uses a B-tree architecture where you um, you have all those chunks, right? It builds a B-tree on the chunks so you can insert in the middle and, and all that. And um, so it knows which chunks to load from where. Uh, and um, I, th I think it actually works much better with SSDs because with a spinning disk, you would need to make sure that um, you don't seek. That's the problem with spinning disks is always uh, you need to read as much data as you can while making a round the, around the data, uh, around the, the disk. With SSDs, you can do the seek where you follow the B-tree and then say, okay, here's the data, here's that other data, here's the chunk that I want to load. Got it. Uh, just one last question. What are the these typical chunk sizes? Um, typical chunk size is uh, normally we try to tune for the operating system buffer size. So I think most operating systems have sort of one megabyte or two megabyte buffers. So we use it on Linux. Um, so you, you try to sort of choose your chunk size so that depending on the data size, right? If it's a floating point number, that's eight or double, it's eight bytes. So you, you would pick, you know, two to the 20 divided by eight um, as the chunk size. And if it's, you know, if it's a 32-bit integer, you would, you would pick, uh, you know, two to the 20 divided by four. Um, and that's okay. what you're trying to optimize. So to all the attendees, uh, it will be present on Zulip. So feel free to head to Delhi stream. You'll find 2020-stage-delhi. So head there. Feel free to ask any question you would like to. And uh, Avid will be present there. If you want some of the resources regarding um, at the session that we had, feel free to ask. Okay. So thanks a lot, Avid. Any cl closing session? Oh, sorry, closing okay. remarks? No, that, that's it. So I'm heading over to that uh, Delhi stage right now. So sure. ask me any questions. Thank you. Thanks a lot.